uh, hoping not to give anyone who's sat through 512 post-traumatic stress syndrome. I'm, I'm here to present my case. Now, this has been a real challenge for me to really think of the best possible way to depict the Lapka and to show you what symbolizes um, the purity and perfection of the Lapka. And so I had the good fortune to be visiting my sister in Canada last weekend. And, uh, you know, Canada was pretty much overwhelmed with one specific thing, which was the Olympics. And so it was really watching the Olympics that I had a chance to really see in all aspects of the Olympic Games features that came to mind and reminded me so much of the Latka. And so what I'm going to do today is summarize the case for the lovable Latka, Latka through an analysis of a few events in the Olympic Games. But then I'm going to present to you a little bit about the dark side of the Hamantash, because I think there's a lot of things, we focused an awful lot on triangles here, but I think there are things you guys really need to know about them that are going to have to come out today, because it's only fair to the audience. So thinking about the Latka in connection with the Olympic Games, I can say, well, you know, it's so versatile, it's robust, you know, you can use it for many of the events in the Olympic Games. Um, it's stable, which is a good thing because it gets hit around a lot with those big hockey stick things. So stability is very, very important, and I'm going to come back to that point later on. Um, it's a little bit elastic, that's good. A little bit of give um, allows things to sort of absorb energy and bounce so that they're not shattering into pieces, which is very important. As I said, I'm going to come back to some of these themes later on. And then I saw <laughs> the curling event was another one where the Latka was of incredible value. It's solid, it slides really well on cold surfaces such as ice. You can see here uh, a really focused look at the, the use of the Latka in curling. It's very stylish. I mean, I'm not just talking about the guys who are sort of um, in the curling event, but also the Latka itself. It's very stylish. And even in great adversity, the Latka can still seize the day and be stylish. I, I don't know how they get these guys to wear these clothes. I mean, I wouldn't go out looking like that, but the Latka manages to, de to you know, de deflect a, lo a lot from those outfits. It's also good luck, as you all notice, that some of the, uh, you know, some of the figure skaters really take these things along with them because it makes them feel sort of that there's going to be a portent for good luck with them at all times, and also it's celebratory. Uh, instead of roses, the latke are just thrown across the ice cream for all to celebrate the success of a beautiful run. So I really want to point out, just to, just to get to the conclusion of, I mean, I can't say a lot more, but the thing about latke really is, that they are better than gold. They look gold, but honestly, they are better. These are awards that are even higher than the gold medal. So let me think a little bit about what I should do about the Hamantash. And um, I'm going to put forward these charges and give you some evidence uh, for the validity of these charges. I'm going to show you that they are unreliable, unstable, and the worst possible thing you can Two fates, no, no less. And what's my evidence for that? Well, I have some serious evidence that comes down to some principles of organic chemistry that will be familiar to some of you in this room and some others of you may have sort of seen about these things as you watched your colleagues struggle through their homeworks. It's two principal paradigms, three-membered ring reactivity and chirality. And I will um, give you some discussion of how we can understand the true nature of the Hamantash by thinking about these principles. So let's think about three-membered rings, okay? Well, you know, we do a lot in organic chemistry to tell you what you should expect from a carbon-carbon bond or a carbon-oxygen bond and how you should believe it will behave when you put reactions there. But the three-membered ring is something that shows really unusual hyperreactivity because the bond angles are too constrained. They're not 109 degrees, they're 60 degrees. The, are they 60 degrees? Anyway. <laughs> the, there's torsional strain, there's ring strain. Just ask any 512 student and they will tell you three-membered rings. See, there's probably a three-membered ring out there. <laughs> three-membered rings. 
reactive because they're so strained and they are unpredictable, unreliable, unstable. So let me just give you a couple of examples. You can all remember it's oxide chemistry. Any old nucleophile won't attack a normal ether and open that or attack that ether and react. But the three-membered ring ether is attacked very, very readily. We build all sorts of molecules using that. Um, cover, um, the three-membered rings that are adjacent to positive charges rearrange very readily those pesky cover cation rearrangements that the 512 profs would just plow you down with because they make cool exam questions. They rearrange, not every species rearranges like this, but these three-membered rings certainly do. So what does that say about the Hamantash? And well, you know, you'd be pretty scared <laughs> if that three-membered ring expanded to a four-membered ring Hamantash right on your plate, that would be pretty horrible. Even worse, what would you do with this thing? How are you going to serve these things up? This is terrible. <laughs> it's a disaster. So this instability of three-membered rings, we've got to really draw a line out. So everyone may tell you that triangle is perfect, but what happens if it's not a triangle anymore? <laughs> then I want to, you know, not just using one argument, I need to bring to your attention a second very important point. And I started to think, and I came up with a theory that Hamantaschen may actually be chiral, and I wanted to figure out whether uh, that indeed was going to be a problem, because if they're chiral, we're going to have to worry about enantiomers and purities and who's what and what's going on in the, on the plate. So um, many of you will know what chirality is. We always do this thing. If you don't know what chirality is, look at your hands. They're mirror images of each other, and your hands are chiral. You've had that argument before. Now, organic chemists are pretty obsessed with chiralities. We have medals for chirality. We have journals called chirality. We waste a lot of time talking about chirality. And we know it's a source of much consternation amongst the 512 students. So I decided to do a little reverse engineering of the Hamantash. And I did what people who don't work very much with computers and all sorts of modeling did. I went out and bought some construction paper. <laughs> engineer this Hamantash. I don't cook very much, so I had to do this with paper. And I figured that the pastry is cut in a circle. That's our sort of progenitor, if you will. And uh, so I did that, cut the circle. I had to go to the bookstore and buy a protractor. I lost my protractor from, from a while ago. So I had the pieces. I had what looked like the base structure for the Hamantash. I folded it up and I said, hmm. I'm getting a little worried here because when I fold this thing up, you see these hamantash on plates and they're kind of pinched together, but this is the shape of the true hamantash. Those corners are folded over each other. Are they chiral? Are hamantash chiral? Well, let me show you. You can take a look at these two guys. You will notice that one is the right-handed one, one is the left-handed one, and indeed, they are mirror images of each other. So what are you gonna do? You've got a plate, is it this chirality? Is it that chirality? It's a disaster there on <laughs> So you have to realize that these things are duplicitous and unreliable. I have for you exhibit A, which are the true models of the Hamantash. And I just want to conclude here to really say, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be down on a particular food group here, but how can we possibly support something that's this mercurial? So duplicitous, so du two-faced, so reactionary. I think the evidence speaks for itself. We can only decide in favor of the gold, the golden lacquer. 